Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the Science Oxford Winter Wonders live stream. Uh, my name is Ian uh, and I have my glamorous assistant Daniel who's going to be helping me with all of the equipment and behind the scenes we have the fantastic Emily and Sarah who are dealing with the technical side of things so making sure this goes to YouTube and dealing with your live chat comments. Um, we asked you a question while you were waiting. I can see we've got a number of responses already come in. Uh, in general, we're going to be asking you more questions and getting you to talk to each other during the show. Um, and so when we give you that opportunity to discuss some of the things you'll be seeing, uh, do speak to each other. Do uh, talk to your teachers. Teachers, you can post comments in the live chat. We'll be able to put some of those up on the screen and respond directly to them. Um, so also, if, if any of you have any questions at any point, those can also go into the live chat, and I might be able to try and answer some of those as we move along. Um, I've got uh, a few schools have told us they are here. So I've got a list that I'm going to read out of schools that we know said they're going to be attending. It's quite a long list, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. I know we should have Aston Rowant, uh, All Saints, Barton Park, Buckland, Cuddington and Dinton, Ducklington, Haddenham Community, Harriers Banbury, Lady Grove Park, Manor Junior, Manor Prep, Oakley, Oliver's Battery, Orchard Fields, Our Lady of Lords, Oxfordshire Hospital School, Sand Hills, uh, Southwold, St. Christopher's, St. Joseph's, St. Swithin's, and West Kidlington. Uh, if I have missed you off, I'm sorry. Uh, those are the ones I know of. I'm sure there's more of you here as well. So welcome all of you uh, this, this afternoon. It's great to have so many people watching. And um, with the introductions out of the way, I'm going to come to that question that we asked you while you're waiting. Is it, how would you describe snow to someone who had never seen or experienced it? We've got a brilliant starting response from Ela, who I think that's at St. Christopher's. It's white. Uh, I think that's fantastic. We all know we look at it snow. It's white. Um, and you might see I've got a uh, I've got a, a plate down at the front here with something that looks very much like snow. Uh, and indeed, this looks like a fluffy white powder. Thank you, Tom, for that. But what I can tell you with this, when I'm feeling this, this doesn't feel very cold. Um, and I know some of you said when you're looking that it was cold and it melts. And I'm just going to hold this in my hand in front of the camera. And what we can probably tell there is it, it doesn't appear to be melting in my hand. Um, and the reason for that is that this plate I've got here, that while it looks like snow, it doesn't completely match those descriptions. Um, now, I know that, uh, for example, um, one of the responses I've got here is uh, that snow is a solid formula of water. Um, I think the teacher's name, Francesca Charlton. Snow, I'm not sure the school off the top of the head with this one. Snow is the solid form of water that is cold, white, and made of ice. And that's absolutely right. Snow is made of ice. And basically, it's what happens when it's so cold outside that the rain freezes as it's falling down and we get snowflakes instead. So if I this was really snow here, or cold, white, cold, wet, and fun, it's like fluff in the air. It can be crunchy. It's a fantastic set of description there from, I think that was Orchard Fields. Um, but say, this is fake snow. It's not melting in my hands. I have here some crushed ice just to compare it. Now, this isn't quite as fine as snow. This is chunks of crushed ice. I'm just going to get these out here in my hand. And we can possibly see that this is kind of glistening. And as I move it around, this is kind of, it's wet. You can see there's water there from my hand. This is melting in my hand. And this definitely does feel cold and it's melting away. And you can see there's lots of water forming. Um, but these are much bigger chunks of ice than we'd normally find in snow. So this fake snow I've got isn't matching your fantastic descriptions of snow because it looks the part, but it doesn't feel the part. And anyone experiencing it, you can't crunch it together in the same way that you can with real snow. So this is fake snow that Daniel and I made earlier. Now, I was going to make some more fake snow direct on camera for you, but unfortunately, uh, I got the powders mixed up. Fake snow is made from a white powder, um, and I put them down, and I got them mixed up. So I have here three different white powders, and one of these is sand, one of them is sugar, and one of them is the white powder that we make fake snow out of. So I'm going to get these on the close-up camera so you can have a slightly 
closer look at them. And what you can probably see, if I just move this, these are all kind of white powders. They're all moving around, fine grains. Uh, they're all doing very similar things. They look very similar. None of them are actually snow. None of them are melting. Uh, and what I'm going to do to try and tell these apart is I'm going to add water to each of them. So remember, I've got sand, I've got sugar, and I have our fake snow powder. What I want you to have a quick discussion in your classes is what's going to happen to each of those when I add some water to them? Um, and in particular, how is that going to enable me to tell them apart? So I want you to have that discussion, talk to each other, talk to your teacher, and post any responses in the live chat for us. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to talk about that. OK, off you go. Okay, uh, welcome back. I can see there's been some fantastic discussions. Uh, I've got a, a few people have said various things. Um, so I've had uh, 
Uh, Miss Benham's class saying that think the fake snow is going to float, whereas the sugar will dissolve, but it could also melt. Um, I think Miss McHon's class has said the sugar will dissolve, the stand will say solid, and the snow powder will change into snow. So that's giving us something that might happen with all of them. I think various people have said they think the sugar is going to dissolve. Um, and again, Lady Grove Park saying the white snow powder will change into snow. I mean, that's kind of what we're hoping. As I said, this is how we're going to make the fake snow. So let's try them out. Um, I have here, Milo is asking uh, how hot the water was. It's warm, but not that, but not desperately hot, if that makes any difference. Uh, so I'm going to add some water to our first powder, see if we can figure out what it is. And I add some water in there. The powder is still there going to give it a bit of a, a stir here and it's staying at the bottom it's not floating it certainly doesn't seem to be dissolving um, not very much is happening there um, I think looking at uh, Miss McMahon's class this seems to fit their description of the sand it's just staying there it's staying solid and nothing much has happened with it okay so that's probably our sand Let's try our next powder. Let's see what happens. Pour some water in. Well, it looks already like some of it seems to have disappeared. It seems to maybe it's dissolved. Let me give that a stir. And there's a small amount of powder around the outside, but that's again mostly seems to have dissolved. There's not much left in there, apparently, apart from water. Of course, the sugar's not gone away as such. It's still there. We're pretty sure that sugar, because it's dissolved, it's still there. If I were to taste that, it would be sweet. When it's dissolved, it just means that the water's kind of broken it down to the smallest possible parts and spread it completely through the liquid. Um, so the sugar has dissolved. So that's almost certainly the sugar. And our final powder then, if we're right on our previous discussions, this one is probably our fake snow. So let's add some water. And what we can see here, particularly at the side there, you can see it is swelling up. It's absorbing that water and swelling up into a kind of like a gel. This is our fake snow here, where it's absorbed that water and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and so we've made our fake snow. So fantastic. It looks like your descriptions were really useful in trying to figure out exactly what was going on. Um, but all this talk about snow, even if it's not real snow, is making me feel really cold. Uh, and when it's cold like this in the winter, the, uh, the, the it often gets dark very early as well. The, the nights start um, fading, uh, sort of starting early, getting dark. And what I like to do is just sort of tuck myself in at home, curl up under a blanket to keep warm, get myself a good reading book out, uh, and maybe even light it with a candle to give us a nice warm light. Now, I don't have a reading book and a blanket to hand, but I do have a candle. So I have a candle here, which I'm just going to put right in the camera for you, because what I want here is for you to have a nice close-up look at a candle burning. Um, so I'm just going to light this candle for you. Uh, let me just move that a bit closer. You get a nice view of the candle, because what I want you to do now is to have another discussion in your class about what's actually happening when a candle is burning. I want you to think about all the things that you might uh, see, hear, smell, think about what's actually happening. Maybe tell me what is it you need for the candle to burn in the first place? What's burning? How is it burning? Um, anything interesting else you might want to share um, about a small controlled fire like this? Um, and maybe ways that you could possibly put that candle out. If you have any other questions as well, please feel free to put those in the live chat as well. I'll give you another couple of minutes just to talk about what happens when a candle burns with your class.
Okay, welcome back. We've had some fantastic uh, responses there. Um, and a lot of you said the wax is melting because the flame is so hot. That's Penny there as an example. It's one of them. That's, that's a really good point. Absolutely. The wax is melting because uh, the, the flame is hot. The fire is making the wax melt. Um, and of course, that, that does make the candle shorter. Um, and when it's melting, it's actually need to give it more scientific things. It's saying the wax changes from a solid to a liquid as it melts. And it also says if the candle is scented, it will spread an aroma around the room. And that's absolutely a great point. What's happening there is not only is the wax sometimes turning from a, a solid to a liquid, if you can smell that aroma, then some of it's turning into a gas as well. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just show you that, that I've got another candle. I've got a little birthday candle I'm going to show you on camera. Uh, if I place this in the heat of the flame, what we'll see happening is that it's melting and dripping. You can see there the wax turning into a liquid and dripping down and making a lovely mess. But you can see this candle itself is not actually itself catching on fire. You can see it's it's definitely getting smaller. Some of it uh, has, oh, it's, uh, it's, as it's dripping down, it's getting thinner as it's, as it's melting, but it's not itself actually catching fire. The wax by itself won't actually burn. Um, the heat from the candle does make the, the wax melt. Um, but when we look at a candle, what we see is the wick burning. I've got here a piece of just candle wick. And if I place this in the flame, what you'll see happening is a wick will burn, but actually it burns really quite quickly. Um, you can see how much uh, black is left behind there, and it doesn't burn particularly well. I think somebody else mentioned that some, some of it is left as ashes. You can see we've got some ashes left there on the wick. Um, but the, the wick burnt quite rapidly, but not very effectively. Um, so a wick by itself doesn't really give us a very long candle flame. Wax by itself doesn't burn, but we take them together and I can light this birthday candle by placing the, whack, the, the wick in the flame and lighting it. And now what's going to happen is that the heat from the flame, as many of you mentioned, it's hot. It melts the wax of the candle. But what's actually happening here then is that wax, liquid wax, rather than just dripping straight down, is soaking into the wick. And it's going up to the top. And it's then the wax that is burning as it's... As, as it's coming out of the wick. So the heat right at the very top there is actually turning that liquid wax then into a gas. And that's then um, setting up and that's what's burning. Now we can see that in a bit more detail um, by trying to actually put this candle out. And what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna try and blow the candle out and Daniel's gonna hold the lighter up the top here. And if we watch this really carefully, you can see we've got lots of smoke coming up, and that's actually the wax. Um, and the wax is sort of turning into a vapor and rising up. Um, and if we blow it out, it's no longer burning. Right now, that's all burning. But as it's, that was some of it turn, floating up and turning into as of the vapor floating up and um, not burning. And actually, it was turning then back into a liquid. In fact, someone mentioned that it turns back into a solid if you leave it. In fact, this uh, wax is dripped down to the bottom here is now solid. I can kind of peel this off because it melted, but it's turned back into a solid. I can't even get it off. It's there quite firmly attached to the candlestick. Uh, let's try just putting this candle out again. Oh. And you can see the actual flame travels from the top down the, the trail of wax vapor to relight the wick. We're not getting the flame all the way there to the wick. It's actually traveling all the way down. So the, the, the wax vapor is being relighted from the heat. Normally a fire, the heat from the candle flame itself is enough to keep that wax melting and to keep it burning. Um, and someone else mentioned that we need air as well. I can also just extinguish this flame by covering it over and stopping air getting to the flame. And there again, you can see that wax vapor there turning back um, and condensing out and falling back down again. Now, I'm going to just play you a slow motion video showing you that relighting of a candle just to give you even more detail. Um, and uh, so I'll just leave you with that video briefly.
Okay, so as I say, hopefully that video was um, quite a lot more obvious. So you can see very clearly the, the flame traveling down through that vapor trail um, to relight the candle. Now, we've got a different um, demonstration I'm going to show you now. And one of the other things that helps um, helps us survive the kind of the cold, dark nights in winter are lovely drinks. Now, sometimes people might drink lovely hot drinks, like maybe a hot chocolate or something, or some people might have some really colorful, fun drinks. I'm going to try and make a colorful, fun drink from some of the uh, things I just find in the kitchen here. Um, so I'm going to make these for you. I'm going to show you this on the camera. I've got to show you what my ingredients are. I've got, first of all, I'm going to start with some golden syrup. Now, lovely, thick, sticky golden syrup, um, nice and sweet. Give us a base for our drink. And I'm just going to pour some of this into our glass. You can see as it's coming out, it's really thick and gloopy. I'm just going to pour a bunch there into the glass. Right. So what kind of drink do you think I might be making? Next, we've got something green. Uh, unfortunately, this is actually, uh, this is washing up liquid. Um, so I might have picked the wrong things from our kitchen. But uh, maybe I won't be drinking this at the end. But uh, this is also quite thick, but not as sticky as our golden syrup. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if I pour this carefully, what you'll see, if I run it down the side here, I can get this. And carefully, they don't mix. So they're both nice and thick, and I can get the washing up liquid to just sit on the top of the golden syrup without mixing. So while I won't be able to drink this, at least this might make it easier to clean up afterwards with all of this washing up liquid. There we go. So we've got a lovely golden layer and a green layer. All right. Next up, something... I definitely can drink. Just got some ordinary water. Now I need to be a little bit more careful this time because we know washing up liquid and water do like to mix together. If I was not very careful here, you know what would happen. Washing up liquid water, I'd make lots and lots of bubbles. Now whilst that's normally great fun, that's not what I'm looking to do right now. So I'm going to be trying to be very, very careful when I pour the water in because if I'm lucky, I do this nice and gently. I should get a nice layer of water sitting on the top of the washing up liquid. Now, there's going to be a little bit of mixing. It's very hard to do this without water and washing up liquid mixing. So, a nice and slow and try and gently pour it down the edge of the glass. There we go. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of mixing there, but we have got a nice, relatively clear layer. There's a little bit of green tendrils coming from the washing up liquid. And finally, I have some oil. So again, something I can technically drink, but something I probably shouldn't drink. So I'm going to put that on the top. Now, a lot of you have probably noticed before that oil and water don't mix. So I should need to be a little bit less careful than I was with the water and the washing up liquid. And so I pour this on the top. And here we go. There's a lovely kind of oh, bit too fast there. There we go, a lovely yellow layer sitting on the top. <laughs> so Our Lady of Lords is asking, would they want to know why I'm putting washing up liquid on syrup and how are they not mixing? That's an excellent question. Um, as I said, one of the things I'm doing is being quite careful to make them not mix, but also they were both so very thick and sticky that they didn't really want to mix very well. Obviously, it's much harder with the later ones, but if you're really careful, you can get them to not mix. Whereas, for example, the oil and the water Oil and water really don't like mixing. Um, so having made these this lovely four-layer drink, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to drop some stuff in it. First of all, I have a stone. Oops. I just want you to have a quick think. 
what's going to happen when I drop a stone in? I think Miss Charlton's class have already figured out what I'm doing. Six CO. Um, so a stone, nice and heavy. Uh, what's going to happen? I drop it in, and you can see there it's fallen right to the bottom. But it took quite a while to drop through the golden syrup there. The golden syrup was so thick and sticky um, that it was took quite a while for the stone to fall through. Now, I've got some other things we're going to put, drop in as well. I want you to have a quick think about each of these. I have a date. I'm just trying to work out where I am. There we go. I have a date. I have a slice of banana. And I have a slice of apple. Um, three different fruits. So, so dates are quite chewy and have a stone in them. Uh, bananas have got quite a thick skin. Apples have got a nice thin skin. and also actually got quite a lot of air in them. So I'm going to drop each of these in and watch what happens. First of all, we go date. Then we go banana. And finally, apple. So I might need to spin this around so you can see a little bit more easily where they've ended up. We've got a date down here floating right in between the golden syrup and the washing up liquid. We have the banana here in between the water and the oil. And we have the apple floating right on top of the oil. So with that information, I have another question for you to have a think about. How was I able to layer these liquids up in the first place? That should be enough clues of what's going on in that picture there. But how could we stack them in this way? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to talk about that in your class. OK, and welcome back. Um, so lots of uh, excellent responses again. Um, I can see, for example, 
uh, various people said, Hannah says, for example, the golden syrup is really thick, so it stays to the bottom. And Amelia then said the bottom one is thick, and then it gets thinner and thinner. So that's actually right. Each of the layers is kind of thinner. But more importantly, um, it says, as Miss Charlton's class A, it's because the different liquids have different densities. The bottom is the heaviest. So density is basically a special word that means how heavy something is or how much it is. You can see what I tried to do on each of these layers is put about the same amount in, which is to say the same volume. Each of these is about the same height, so put about the same volume in, but the golden syrup at the bottom is heavier um, for that same volume of liquid. It is denser. And things of the dent lighter things float on top of denser things. That's why the apple uh, is relatively light. It's not very dense because it's got quite a lot of air mixed in with the, the fruit. And so it floats right on the top of oil. In the same way, oil floats on the top of water and, and the banana floats on top of water as well. So banana and oil have about the same density. The, de the, the, the date is really dense. It's about the same density as the washing up liquid, whereas the stone, of course, is very, very dense. It's a complete solid with no air or, or, or liquid inside. So that sinks all the way to the bottom. So that's absolutely right. Each of these liquids, thicker, heavier, as one sit at the bottom and I can layer them onto one. As long as I'm really careful not to mix them, then those different densities will stack on top of each other. I know one of the classes said, ask six CEO, I think said, I was, are you making a density tower? That's absolutely what we call this. It's a density tower because I've got these different liquids with different densities. Um, and it's not just four liquids we can do this because I have here an even taller density tower. That I've made with eight different liquids. Um, and just labeled what they are. So you can see this is very much one we absolutely couldn't drink. But you can see right at the bottom, like in our original glass, we've got golden syrup. It's very, very uh, thick and um, heavy. And on top of that, I've got glycerin. Glycerin is a type of sugar. Um, so it's similar density to golden syrup. Obviously, it's got a lot of sugar in it. And then on top of the glycerin, I have milk. Um, the washing up liquid on top of the milk, then the water on top of that. And again, you can see, like in our glass, there's been a little bit of mixing between those two layers. On top of the water, oil, like in our glass, and then even lighter than oil, I've got alcohol and then paraffin right on the very top. We could make an even taller density tower if we had other um, questions. Well. Now, I've got a question from uh, year four at Our Lady of Lords. Why does the fruit sit in different layers? And that's because basically everything has a different density. Because the date has a stone and it's partially dried out, it's very, very dense. It's basically a lot of fair amount, lots of fair amount of water. It's, it's not quite as heavy as the stone. Each of these liquids is heavy, it's, well, it's lighter as we go up. And the fruit, some of them basically are, are denser than the lighter liquid. They're heavier than the lighter liquid, so they will sink through them. Denser things will sink through lighter things. So the stone is denser than all the liquids, and it sinks all the way to the bottom. The apple floats on the top of the oil in the same way that you might have seen wood will float on water. And that's what happened here. The banana will also float on water. Lots of things will float on water. Other things will sink through them. But it, because we've got lots of different densities here, we see something unusual. Normally, we only think of things floating on water because that's really the only liquid we come across in large quantities most of the time. But because each of the liquids has a different density, each of the liquids has, is differently heavy, then um, they will the diff things will float at different layers in our density tower because different fruits are of uh, So um, one really interesting experiment you can possibly try at home sometime is trying it with, say, a satsuma. And what I want you to try and do is, first of all, do it with the peel on and then take the peel off and try it again and see if anything strange happens and what you might um, see. Yeah, so 6 was saying they're really surprised that water was heavier than oil. No, absolutely. So we, we often think of oil as quite heavy, but actually it does float on water. And we see this actually quite often at home. If you ever do sort of mix up water and oil in a pan, you will see little, normally just little drops of oil float on top. But yeah, oil actually is less dense than water. It kind of spreads out quite a lot and it will float on the surface. Um, this is one of the reasons that oil spills can be quite dangerous in the sea because they will spread across the surface of the sea and that can really cause problems for sea animals. If it sank right to the bottom, it would probably be less of a problem for many animals. But being on the top, it really stops them being able to get up to the surface. Um, I have another really exciting liquid to show you next, but I'm going to have to be a little bit more careful with this one because I'm going to show you a liquid that's really, really cold. So I'm going to have to take some special precautions. Um, I have some equipment I'm going to need to put on. 
First of all, I have an apron, which is going to protect me if there are any spillages. Because I really don't want this cold liquid to spill onto my clothes. And next I have a face shield to protect me from any splashes. I really don't want any of this splashing into my face. And finally, I have some great big gloves. These are nice and thick and will protect me from the cold because this liquid is liquid nitrogen inside this. And liquid nitrogen is boiled at minus 196 degrees centigrade. So it's not something I can touch and I can't touch anything that goes in this because it would be so cold, it would burn my, my hand. So I need to be wearing these gloves if I touch anything that goes in here. So liquid nitrogen is basically air. Most of air is nitrogen. Uh, and so the way you make liquid nitrogen is by cooling down the air. You get it so cold that the air actually condenses and turns into a liquid. Um, and so right inside here, I basically most got liquid air. It's about 78% of the air. And, and it's boiling. I can see it in here, and I'll show you later. It's boiling away. Um, so right in there, it's minus 196 degrees centigrade. Um, and because it's that cold, and that's also the temperature at which air will turn into a liquid, I can turn more air into liquid. So. I have some air I've previously captured. So I've got a balloon full of air. And if I push this into my liquid nitrogen, the air inside the balloon will get cold enough that um, it will turn into a liquid. Now, when I do this, there is a possibility the balloon might burst. So do be aware that there might be an unexpected bang at some point. Hopefully not. But I'm going to push my balloon down into the liquid nitrogen. And first of all, for you can probably see there's lots and lots of fog coming off here. Mist is coming as. Uh, it's getting really, really cold. I'm pushing some of the liquid nitrogen out of the container. But you can probably see here the balloon is deflating as the air inside is turning into a liquid. And obviously, liquids take up a lot less space than solids. So that means there's just a few, basically, a few drops of liquid inside the balloon. Um, and now, I'll take the balloon back out. And you can see it's taking up hardly any space. But I pop it onto the desk. You can see it warms up really, really quickly. And it starts to reinflate as the, the air inside is turning back into a gas. It's expanding. All these particles are spreading out as it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. And so the balloon reinflates. This is the point at which it's most likely to go bang. Hopefully, it won't this time like so. Last little bit. There we go. So there's our reinflating balloon. Now, because this is so cold, I already mentioned it's quite dangerous. I'm going to show you now what happens to living material that might get immersed in this really, really cold liquid. I have at the back here uh, a flower. Now, we don't necessarily see large numbers of flowers during the winter. Um, so this is a nice rare kind of winter. It's a poinsettia, kind of a flower we often get in winter. Um, but flowers don't do very well in winter because it's normally so cold outside. The cold doesn't work well with the delicate nature of flowers. You can see these very soft uh, petals on the flower here. I'm going to show you what happens when I put this in liquid nitrogen. So one thing you can see again is lots of mist coming off. Oh, and I pull out the flower. It's already kind of mostly fallen apart. So here we have our really, really cold flower. Um, and it's still looking very delicate. But watch what happens now. It just crushes to pieces. I've completely frozen all the water inside that flower, and it falls right apart, making a horrible mess there. So that's one of the reasons 
you know, flowers do not really like the winter for the most part, although it never gets this cold out in the real world. Um, say so minus 196 degrees centigrade inside here, the coldest you're ever likely to find out in the real world. In the really coldest one, it's maybe down to minus 50 or minus 60 degrees centigrade. Now, at the very start of the video, I teased you um, with some fake snow. Uh, and I'm going to try and see if we can make any real snow now. Now, for the one thing, you can possibly see around the very lid of my container here. Earlier, when I was pushing the balloon in, some of the liquid nitrogen spilled over the side. And so this here is now really, really cold. And you can possibly see that around the rim, we've formed some frost. This is basically some snow that's formed on the rim there. I can scrape that off. It's a small amount of snow formed on there. And we also saw some mist. And I can show you even better. If I'm going to blow into this container of liquid nitrogen, what you'll see happening is the the water vapor in my breath is going to turn into fog or mist. So there are lots and lots of fog. And what's happening um, is that, uh, say, the water vapor in my, in my mouth uh, is turning, it's condensing down into tiny droplets, first of water, and then actually some of it's going to be freezing, and so turning into snow. The same thing that happens in clouds is why clouds look kind of white like this is actually water vapor in the air condenses down into tiny droplets of water, which eventually get big enough to fall down as rain or if it's cold enough as snow. So this fog I create here is actually cold enough that some of these tiny, tiny white things you can see are actually be tiny, tiny snowdrops. Um, Rory has a question. He's asking uh, how how something solid like the flower can turn dry when it gets cold. And that's a really good point. We often think of cold things as feeling a bit wet, and that's because they're normally just cold enough that, for example, we put them on hand, they feel a bit wet. Like if you pick up snow, it melts on your hand. But it gets so cold that the water turns into ice that is no longer wet. It's now basically really brittle. It's turned into a proper solid, but the flowers were so thin that that is basically a very thin, brittle solid that then breaks apart. Um, if it was bigger, then basically, if you had a big chunk of ice that was that cold, it wouldn't feel at all wet. It would just be really, really solid, like a really hard stone. One last thing I'm going to do. I'm going to take some of this liquid. I'm going to pour it into this frying pan so you can see the liquid boiling away. And then I'm going to hopefully get the pan cold enough that we can try and make even more snow. So I'm going to pour. Oh, I know what I need. I just need to. Put my visor back down. Pour this liquid nitrogen into my frying pan. Now, when the uh, the fog lifts off, hopefully you'll be able to see the liquid is boiling away there, getting lots more fog because there's lots of water vapor in the air turning back into kind of a fog or a mist. And this, the liquid nitrogen here is now boiling away, but it's also making this pan really, really cold. Now let's just get rid of the excess. Now this pan is really cold. You can see again all that water vapor turning into fog. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to spray just a little bit of mist from this water mister onto the frying pan. And you can probably see it's forming this kind of white powder all over the surface. Here, this is frost. We turn it like snow. We form here basically on the surface of the pan where it's so very cold. Okay. Oh. Right take this back off as Daniel gets rid of my liquid nitrogen. So we're very nearly at the end. Um, and like before, we've made some real snow now instead of just the fake snow. And of course, dealing with real snow has really started to make me feel cold. So I think it's time to go back to our candle, um, get ourselves warm again. So here I have another candle. We just light that, like so. And one final thing. Mm. 
Mmm. Delicious. Mm -mm -mm. That's made me feel a lot better. Um, now, obviously, that wasn't a real candle. Please don't try this at home. Um, candles are not normally edible. So I'm going to leave you with just one last question. And that is, what do you think that candle was actually made of that enabled me to eat it? If you have any ideas, feel free to put them in the live chat now or send them to us at schools at scienceoctor.com or um, uh, try and find us on our social media stream streams if that's useful. Teachers, if you want to know how we did that, if you contact us or leave us your contact details here, then we can send you a resource that tells you exactly what we did there and how you can reproduce that. Um, thank you all very much for coming. It's been fantastic reading your comments. Um, and we'll leave you with this question. Uh, the one thing is we would, if, uh, if you enjoyed this, we think it was, uh, that we have a feedback survey in the video description below. Could you just, teachers, could, if you could possibly fill in our feedback survey, just let us know if there's anything we could improve if we do this again. Thank you very much.